Good morning. I'd like to thank Debbie and the conference planning committee for inviting me to speak today. I wish I could be there in person, but I'm happy to participate in this virtual environment. My talk today will be on clampless cardioplegia technique that we utilize at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. I have no disclosures. I'll be talking about the development of a clampless cardioplegia protocol and the use of this technique on six patients between 2016 and 2019. The one thing that all of these patients had in common is that they were all very complex patients who were unable to be cross-clamped with conventional technique. The inability to use a cross-clamp, especially if you realize it during the dissection process of a nighttime redo, presents a unique and difficult situation. We found at our institution, we need to utilize various methods of delivery as well as a rest solution in order to optimize the surgical repair for our patients. Clampless or systemic cardioplegia may not be the most elegant form of cardioplegia in your toolbox, but it's great to have when the aortic cannot be cross-clamped or the risks of doing so outweigh the benefits. I think you'll all agree that our patients have evolved along with our surgical techniques. They're presenting to the cardiac OR sicker than ever before. The patients in our practice at Cincinnati Children's Hospital over the last year and a half have been some of the most complex patients I've seen in the 36 years I've been in perfusion. Cross-clamping the aorta is not a benign process. It can lead to immediate or late aortic dissection or rupture, as indicated in the literature. Although the documented incidence is relatively low. We all know that when it happens, it can be catastrophic. And the law of the lever states that the tissue near the hinge of the cross clamp is under more stress than the tissue that's distal to the hinge. And this unequal pressure distribution is what occurs that injures the native aorta or the neo aortas. In 2016, a patient presented to our institution whose pathology made it impossible to apply a standard cross clamp and cardioplegia technique. It was necessary to arrest the heart and perform deep hypothermic circulatory arrest without cross-clamping the aorta. The clampless cardioplegia technique had never been attempted at our institution, but our lead surgeon had used it at another facility. This process has become affectionately referred to at our institution as San Quentin cardioplegia. And in order to utilize this new technique, our team developed a task force to develop a process that included a team of pharmacists, cardiac surgeons, and perfusionists. We created a pharmacy order set and an algorithm for calculating the dose, the induction dose of systemic cardioplegia. The induction dose is simply 0.02 milliequivalents of KCL times the patient's total circulating volume, which as we all know is circulating blood volume plus the prime volume in the pump. That will equate to a serum potassium level of 20 milliequivalents per liter. And when you add the patient's existing serum potassium level to this, you approximate the 26 milliequivalent per liter concentration that most cardioplegic solutions have today. And the final concentration of solution is prepared in one milliequivalent per ml doses and put into 60 ml syringes. The EPIC order set was created, and it was created so that you could not pull up the order set by typing in common terms like cardioplegia or potassium chloride, you could only access it by typing clampless cardioplegia. And this was a safety mechanism put in place to prevent it from accidentally being ordered for a patient and uh, prevent a lethal dose of cardioplegia to be given. The order can only be placed by an attending cardiac surgeon who has to include the patient's circulating blood volume information, the prime volume, and the requested dose of potassium chloride. A verbal order can be placed in emergencies, and when the order comes in to pharmacy, they verify the dosage, and a backup dosage is prepared along with every induction dose in the event that we need to give an additional amount of cardioplegia during the case. Um, the dose cannot be picked up by, cannot be delivered anywhere in the hospital. It can only be picked up by a perfusionist since we are really aware of what the solution is and how lethal it can be if not given to a patient on bypass. The dose is verified again between the primary and backup perfusionist in the operating room. The primary dose is kept on the pump and the backup dose is stored in the perfusion cart uh, out of the way so it won't be accidentally picked up and used on another patient accidentally. 
So the delivery process is uh, typically we will cool the patient to the desired temperature. A lot of times it's 18 degrees. All ultrafiltration is discontinued immediately after um, administering the dose in order to not decrease the systemic concentration of potassium chloride. And the full dose of systemic cardioplegia is given into the pump manifold. After the heart arrests and the KCL is well distributed, uh, deep hypothermic circulatory arrest is usually initiated. So I have a set of two slides for each patient that I'm gonna present. Um, and I wanna describe what information is on each slide as I'll have to run through the information fairly quickly in order to meet the time requirements for this talk. The first slide, which is this one, describes the patient diagnosis, the prior surgical history, and the clampless surgical procedure. The second slide in each series outlines the cardioplegia dose, the fluctuation in potassium concentrations, and the dilutional ultrafiltration volumes that we uh, remove to manipulate the final serum potassium concentration, uh, as well as the bypass on, off, and muff time. So this is our first patient. It was a fourth time redo on a three-month-old, 3.9 kilogram female who had an original diagnosis of hypoplastic left heart with uh, aortic and mitral atresia. Prior surgeries included a Norwood with a Sano shunt, and due to worsening cyanosis, the Sano shunt was revised nine days uh, after the initial Norwood. And then there was an emergent conversion to a BT shunt with continuing hypoxia and desaturations, which led us to schedule the clampless procedure six days later, which was a revision of a BT shunt to a central shunt. And the reason for the clampless procedure on this uh, case was that the surgeon had to sew the proximal end of the central shunt to the ascending neo-aorta, and there physically wasn't enough room to do that and place a cross clamp. So for this procedure, we gave 10 milliequivalents of KCL administered through the manifold to the patient uh, after reaching 18 degrees, and this resulted in immediate arrest followed by 18 minutes of uh, deep hypothermic circulatory arrest. Now on this second slide, uh, you'll see that in the upper right-hand corner will be the bypass times, um, circuit rest times, integrated cerebral times. The green bars on the left will show card cardioplegia, um, concentrations, the fluctuation in serum potassium, and the dilutional ultrafiltration volumes that we remove during the course of bypass. On the graft itself, the blue columns represent the uh, potassium concentrations and it's graduated to the left vertical axis, and the fluctua fluctuations in ultrafiltration that we remove is this gold line, which is graduated against the right um, vertical axis. So prior to arrest on this patient, the potassium was 2.5 millimoles per liter. The blood gas was drawn after circ arrest that showed the potassium increased to 6.5 millimoles per liter, which was a 2.6 increase from the baseline value. We utilized dilutional ultrafiltration routinely during the entire course of bypass on all of our patients. And the routine wash solution that we utilize is plasmolite A with 20 milliequivalents of bicarb and 200 milligrams of calcium chloride added per liter. In extreme cases of hyperkalemia and hypernatremia, we utilize normal saline or half normal saline uh, to control those electrolyte levels. Duff was started on this patient after the uh, circulatory arrest period during the rewarming phase. We removed 2,100 mLs of total effluent, which was six and a quarter times the patient's circulating blood volume during two hours of bypass. And that resulted in a potassium value of 3.9 millimoles per liter after modified ultrafiltration. And the cardioplegia administered during the case will be um, visualized by a drop-down arrow from the top. Our second patient was the first patient after the clampless policy was in place. The patient was a 28-year-old, 70-kilogram female. The, this patient was also the fourth patient in this series. Uh, her original diagnosis was a type 1 truncus. Prior surgeries included eight sternotomies three neoaortic valve replacements, five RV to PA heterograft and allograft conduit replacements, and a transcatheter RPA stent. The reason for the clampless procedure um, was the patient presented with a pulsatile mass in the suprasternal notch due to a large pseudoaneurysm that originated from the distal anastomosis of the previous ascending aortic cortex graft. 
The location of the pseudoaneurysm made it impossible to cross clamp the aorta. So this was the ninth time redo sternotomy for resection of the ascending aortic pseudoaneurysm. The patient was cooled to 18 degrees and administered 110 milliequivalents of potassium chloride, which caused a full arrest within one minute. This was followed by three periods of circ arrest and two periods of anti-grade cerebral perfusion over the next two hours on bypass. An additional half dose of uh, delnidocardioplegia, which is indicated by the yellow area, the yellow arrow, uh, the half dose was 10 mLs per kilo of delnido, was administered 122 minutes after the clampless dose. The serum potassium rose from 3.8 to greater than 14 millimoles per liter, and the post-MUF uh, potassium was 4.1. The total potassium delivered on this patient was 125 milliequivalents, and we removed almost eight liters of fluid uh, through dilutional ultrafiltration, which was almost two times the patient's circulating blood volume during 4.2 hours on bypass. Patient number three was a nine kilogram, one-year-old male with two prior sternotomies. His original diagnosis was a DORV with a D transposition, subpulmonary VSD, and an interrupted aortic arch. Prior surgeries were a repair, uh, an arterial switch repair, a DORV with aortic arch repair, and direct anastomosis of the interrupted aortic arch. This was done at an outside hospital that uh, resulted in a very short aorta with the coronaries implanted very high on the aortic root. And this was a reason for utilizing a clampless cardioplegia solution on this patient because there was no room to apply a clamp. Uh, the clampless procedure was a third time redo sternotomy, tubular extension of the ascending aorta, LPA and MPA plasty, RBOT work, and a VSD closure. We cooled this patient to 18 degrees. Um, the heart arrested within seconds after the clampless dose of 20 milliequivalents, and that was followed by three periods of hypothermic circulatory rest and one period of anti-grade cerebral perfusion. So on this patient, uh, there were osteal doses of del nido cardioplegia given after the clampless dose of 25 mLs per, per kilo total uh, and this was given 66 minutes after the clampless induction, followed by 10 mLs per kilo, a half dose of anagrade del nido two hours later. Serum potassium rose from 4.1 to 9.5, and the post-MUF K was 4.4, with the final serum potassium in the OR being 3.3 uh, prior to transport to the ICU. The total potassium delivered on this patient was 26 milliequivalents, and we removed four liters of effluent, which was five and a quarter times the patient circulating blood volume during five hours on bypass. Patient number four uh, was a 69-year-old, 69 kilogram, 29-year-old female with nine prior sternotomies. The original diagnosis was a type one truncus, and the patient was also our second patient in this series. Uh, the reason for the clampless procedure is the patient had endocarditis with vegetations on her aortic valve, and there was no clear indication of how far they extended up into the ascending aorta, so the surgeon did not want to uh, clamp the aorta and risk embolizing the patient. Um, it was a 10th time reduced sternotomy, Bentall procedure, excision of Hancock RV to PA conduit and reconstruction, RPA intravascular scent removal, and an RCA coronary arterioplasty. We cooled this patient to 18 degrees and administered the clampless dose of 110 milliequivalents of KCL, causing a full arrest. However, there was return of uh, minor atrial activity within two minutes, so an additional half dose, which was 60 milliequivalents, was given, causing complete and sustained arrest. And this was followed by nine periods of deep hypothermic circulatory arrest. So as you can tell from this graph, this was a crazy case for us. Uh, the patient received a total of 2.5 doses of clampless cardioplegia, which equaled a total of 280 milliequivalents of KCL. There were three osteal and two anagrade doses of del nido cardioplegia for a total of an additional 80 milliequivalents of potassium chloride for a grand total of 360 milliequivalents of uh, potassium chloride given to the patient over almost eight hours of bypass. The serum potassium rose from 3.6 to 9.0 after the first one and a half doses of clampless, and the highest serum potassium was 11.4 after the second full clampless dose and the first anagrade dose of del nido cardioplegia. 
The post MOF potassium was 6.9, and the last serum potassium in the operating room prior to transport to the ICU was 5.7 millimoles per liter. Um, for the dilutional ultrafiltration data, we removed a whopping 16 and a half liters of effluent from this case, which equaled four times the patient's circulating blood volume. And to give you an idea of what the wash solution was that we used on this particular patient because the amount of potassium was so uh, excessive, uh, the 16 and a half liters included nine liters of normal saline, 3.3 liters of half normal saline, 5.2 liters of plasmalite uh, over a 7.8 hour pump run. Patient number five uh, was a frequent flyer with our program and went on to have an ABO incompatible transplant um, three months later. He was a 6.6 .6 kilogram, four month old patient with three prior sternotomies. The original diagnosis was a complex single ventricle, DILV with a D transposition, coarctation of the aorta, and the patient also had a hypercoagulable state. Prior surgeries included a Norwood procedure with a DT shunt. Uh, the patient had several thrombotic shunt occlusions, an ECPR recovery with an AV ECMO run, and multiple stents to the DT shunt. There was an eventual bidirectional blend done with a subsequent cervical AV fistula created in response to continued hypoxia uh, in the patient after the bidirectional gland had been completed. The reason for the clampless procedure was the surgeon could not clamp the neoaorta, and the clampless cardioplegia was ordered by a verbal order from the surgeon while dissecting 40 minutes prior to initiating bypass. So it was really important uh, in this particular uh, patient that we were able to place a verbal order because we were not planning on doing it um, at the start of the case. The surgical procedure was the third time redo sternotomy for a failed Glenn physiology, a takedown bidirectional Glenn, RPA and SBC reconstruction, and the implantation of a right modified DT shunt. We cooled this patient to 30 degrees and 16 milliequivalents of, of KCL was used to arrest the heart. There was no additional cardioplegia given besides the clampless dose. The serum potassium rose from 2.7 to 14. The post muff uh, serum potassium was 5.4, and the final serum potassium in the OR prior to transport to the ICU was 4.9 millimoles per liter. Uh, ultrafiltration, we removed four times the circulating blood volume uh, during three and a half hours on bypass. And finally, our last patient, patient number six, was an 80 year old, 80 kilogram, excuse me, 52 year old patient, a female patient with five prior sternotomies. The original diagnosis was Tetralogy of Fallot, and her prior surgeries included a palliation with a Waterston shunt at two months of age, which ended up being the main reason she required a clampless procedure. This palliation made the aorta stiff and immobile, and it could not be dissected and freed up circumferentially um, to accommodate a cross clamp. Uh, the patient had a, a complete TET repair at four years of age, three additional RVOT repairs at 7, 10, and 41 years of age. And at 51 years of age, she had a melody valve placed, which six months later nearly completely occluded with vegetations from endocarditis, putting her into acute right heart failure with sepsis and hypoxia. So her clampless procedure was an emergent six-time redo sternotomy. She was placed on femoral bypass prior to the sternotomy to decompress the heart cooled the patient to 18 degrees and administered 108 milliequivalents of KCL. There was an immediate arrest followed by 31 minutes of deep hypothermic circulatory arrest. Uh, the serum potassium on this patient increased two and a quarter times from 4.1 to 9.0. The post muff serum potassium was 5.2 and the final serum potassium in the OR was 4.3 prior to transport. From a dilutional ultrafiltration <clears throat> standpoint, excuse me, we removed 7.7 .7 liters of effluent, which was 1.75 times her, cir uh, her circulating blood volume during uh, five hours and 41 minutes of bypass. So in summary, the average increase in serum potassium with our clampless cardioplegia process was 3.1 times the patient's baseline value in the operating room. All serum potassium values were within normal ranges at the end of modified ultrafiltration, except for one outlier, the 6.9 value. 
This was a patient that received an excessive 360 mil equivalent of KCL during bypass. And even this patient's value was within normal ranges prior to leaving the operating room for transport to the ICU. And none of the patients showed any significant potassium rebound increases 24 hours post-op from the baseline values in the operating room. So in summary, there are a wide variety of cardioplegia formulations and strategies that are available with really no optimal formula that's well-defined for every surgeon in every um, surgical situation. We feel at Cincinnati Children's Hospital that you need to in integrate various methods of cardioplegia delivery as well as different myocardial preservation solutions in order to optimize the surgical repair for our patients. This series of patients showed no cardiac functional change by post-op echo, and there were no perioperative complications to report. The use of this technique has allowed us to successfully operate on patients at our facility that would have been considered inoperable with other more conventional techniques. Thank you very much.